welcome. It's uh, just about one o'clock. Uh, I'm Kevin O'Brien, and uh, I'm going to do a presentation on the fundamentals of encryption. Uh, I'm hoping that I can get through all of this. Uh, if not, I have a website. Uh, I don't know if you can read that up there. Zwilnik.com is the site, um, and all of my slideshows are up there. Everything is Creative Commons uh, attribution share alike licensed. So you can download it, reuse it, whatever. Ohio Linux uh, so, 2015. Hmm? OK. Um, also, I, I might as well mention, because someone asked me about it a few minutes ago, I record shows for Hacker Public Radio. And um, I have shows there on security, as well as on LibreOffice, which are two of the things that I've been involved with. So there's a lot of material there as well. But enough of this shameless self-promotion. <laughs> So, as I said, I was a little bit worried about whether I could get through everything, so I dropped a few of the initial slides that went through the history of this. Um, if, if you really want to know about the history of hidden writing, which is literally what cryptography means, cryptos is hidden and <coughs> graphene is uh, Greek for writing, you know, you can get the whole slide deck and see it. Uh, you know, we've been doing this stuff for a long time. The, you know, Julius Caesar used something called a Caesar cipher, which is, if you've ever used ROT13, that's a Caesar cipher. You know, everything gets moved the same amount. Um, slightly better is a substitution cipher, and you may have seen in the newspaper those kind of brain teasers to decode something. Um, obviously, they're not that hard. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the newspaper for everyone to do. Uh, and the reason is they're sub they are subject to statistical analysis. So you may, uh, this was actually shown in the ninth century. So it's been known for quite a long time. So in English, we know that certain letters are more frequent than others. There are certain combinations that happen. And so in the uh, 19th century, a uh, Frenchman came up with something called the Visionaire Square. And this was a technique that would allow you to do a substitution where uh, the letter substituted changed every time you did a, another character. Um, and it, it's, it's not bad. If it's reused, however, it can also be statistically analyzed, as was shown by Charles Babbage. And yes, it is that Charles Babbage, the computer guy. Um, so one-time pads is an application of the visionaire square, whereby uh, you would have pads made up, and you would use, you take the top sheet, you'd use it to <coughs> encrypt a message, and take that sheet off and throw it away. You would never reuse it again. That's actually pretty secure. Um, but there's a problem here, which is how do you distribute this pad? <coughs> so if you're going to use it among a number of different correspondents, you have to distribute a number of different copies of the same pad, and all it takes is for one of them to be looked at by an enemy, and you have no security. So this question of how you can distribute these things is really key. Um, now, there have also been some mechanical things, like the uh, Captain Midnight decoder ring, which is really just another Caesar cipher. Everything is rotated the same amount. And then there's the Enigma machine. Um, now, we had a movie about all of that recently. <laughs> Very interesting movie about Turing and uh, the people in England trying to figure that out. Uh, Basically, the Enigma was just a really, really complicated mechanical device 
Uh, you would have a number of different disks. Each disk would be rotated after encrypting, after uh, changing one letter. Um, but a, a group of Polish scientists figured out how to analyze this stuff, passed it along to the British, and in Bletchley Park they set up an operation to decode these things. Uh, and what we're dealing with here is the whole question of randomness. Uh, and random is something that I think a lot of people don't entirely understand what it means to be random. Uh, it is really the key uh, to uh, all of this stuff. Enigma was flawed in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, generally speaking, if it's a mechanical way of changing one letter to another, it's not random. You know? <laughs> there is no way you can mechanically create randomness. Um, and as it turns out, one of the conditions with the Enigma machine that they made use of, no letter could be encrypted as itself. You might think, well, that, that's not a big uh, clue, really. But it turns out it's very important that you know that. You know, anything that gets you away from 100% pure randomness is a thread that a good cryptographer can grab and do something with. So with Bletchley Park, what you were seeing was the first application of computers to break codes. Um, and you not only had the bomb machines that were used uh, against the Enigma, but then a uh, computer called Colossus that was used for the Lorenz cipher, which was actually even more secure than the Enigma machine. But along the way, they started to realize, wait a minute, if computers can break codes, can they create them? And they started to realize, yeah, that is. And so one of the things that is very important in understanding this technology is to understand that it's an arms race. So nothing is ever <coughs> secure for all time. One of the things that uh, I started hearing a few years ago was, uh, you know, quantum computing is going to come along, and once we have quantum computing, cryptography is absolutely dead. I I'm, I'm seeing people coming up with quantum encryption. All right? So the main thing is you you've got to stay on top of it. This stuff is always changing. But if you don't make a mistake, it is theoretically possible to create something that is going to be pretty unbreakable for some period of time. You take a look at a number of the encryption schemes in use today. NIST will typically say, we expect this to be unbreakable up through about the year 2030, based on their estimate of how fast computing technology is going to evolve. But you always want to stay on top of that. Now, key distribution is still the big problem. How, how do we exchange keys with each other? Right? So my friend Tom over there, I want to send him an encrypted message. And you know, pay attention to Tom. He's a smart guy. Um, I want to send a message. I've got to get a key. So, well, he's sitting there. I could just walk over and say, Tom, here's the key I'm going to use. Well, and that's great if we're in the same room and no one is listening in uh, and a few things like that. But, you know, what if Tom is at his office and I'm at my office and we're miles apart and I want to send him a message? How do we do that? Well, three people. Whitfield, Biffy, Martin Hellman, and Ralph Merkel solved that problem and came up with Diffie Hellman Merkel key exchange. Now, you've probably heard it referred to as Diffie Hellman. Well, Martin Hellman said, no, Ralph Merkel deserves to be there. So I'm going to go with that. Uh, and then Whitfield Diffie realized, oh, we could do something that is asymmetric. And the people who solved that problem initially, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman, um, they figured out a way to do that. And it's based on the idea of a one-way function. And when we say one-way, what we're saying is, 
computing it is simple and easy, but undoing it, going in the other direction, we don't say impossible, we say computationally infeasible. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do some calculations on this, and, and I've done them. Um, and even if you are looking at Bitcoin mining rigs that can do a billion hashes per second, and you, well, you know, that's got to be able to do it. Well, just make your password long and complicated enough. And you can do a calculation that says, well, it would take longer than the age of the universe to crack that with present computing technology. So the RSA approach was to take a look at large prime numbers. And uh, I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to get into any detailed mathematics. If you want to learn modular mathematics, it's interesting. I don't understand it, but it's very interesting. <laughs> Um, so, but there is a mathematical basis to all of this. And the idea is that you take two large prime numbers and they should be relatively near each other, multiply them together, and get a very large number. And the reason that is computationally infeasible is discovering the prime factors of this really long number is one of those things that takes a whole lot of computing cycles. And that's why we call it computationally infeasible. Um, well, the RSA procedure, what they do is multiply these together, do a little complicated math, and they create two keys. You've probably heard these referred to as the public key and the private key. Technically, it really doesn't matter which is which. It's two keys. And the idea here is that each key can decrypt what the other key encrypted. But it cannot decrypt what it itself encrypted. And, and that's the key. And by the way, we need to be very careful here. You notice that I'm always talking about decrypting and encrypting. If you hear someone talking about encoding and decoding, those are two different things entirely. Right? Encoding, think of Morse code. You're not hiding anything. ASCII code, you're not hiding it. Those are coding schemes. We're talking encryption. So they're two different concepts entirely. Now, the RSA is not the only one out there. Uh, discrete logarithm, right? If you uh, are creating a, a key pair in Linux, uh, at, at a certain point you'll be asked, what kind of key pair do you want to create? And you'll see several choices, and one of them is RSA, we just talked about. You might see El Gamal. El Gamal is an application of the discrete logarithm. Then there's elliptical curve, a uh, somewhat more recent one. With all of these, this, the basic idea that they all share is that they are easy to compute, computationally infeasible to uncompute. Now, the next thing you want to understand is symmetric versus asymmetric. Because when we talk about key pairs, we're talking about asymmetric. You know, the key that encrypts is different from the key that decrypts. That's what makes it asymmetric. There's also symmetric, and that's when the same key encrypts and decrypts. Now, the thing that we want to understand is that actually symmetric is a whole lot more efficient. So if you're going to do any significant amount of encrypting and decrypting, you probably want to be able to do symmetric. <coughs> A whole lot less CPU cycles are involved. Well, now we've got the key distribution problem. How do we distribute the key? So if you take a look at, uh, and in 
the cryptography area, there are certain canonical names for all of these. It's always Alice and Bob <laughs> who are trying to talk to each other. Eve is the eavesdropper. And then, you know, Mallory is the delicious person and so on. So you start seeing these names. That's just a little bit of uh, cryptanalytic humor. <laughs> um, so public key, which is asymmetric, is where the key pair is generated. And arbitrarily, one of the keys is designated as private and the other as public. Now, the thing about public is, of course, you can give the public key out to anyone. All right? My public key is printed on my web page. No reason it shouldn't be. And a lot of people smarter than me do that. You know, you go to Bruce Schneier's web page. If you're interested in this stuff, Bruce is someone you really want to follow. Um, and he's got a, a blog and a newsletter and all of that that I follow religiously. Uh, so the public key, you know, you can just hand that out. What you don't want to do is give out the private key. And I was just, uh, it was just a story this past week about a uh, company that made the mistake of putting their private key on a publicly accessible website where it sat for about six months. Um, so, you know, this stuff can work if you don't screw up. Right. Now, there are some standards that have been used over the years. Uh, you might have heard of the data encryption standard, DES. Uh, IBM developed that under a contract for the federal government. Uh, employs several techniques. Um, block cipher, and what a block cipher is, is you, you have a key of a certain, let's say a 256-bit key, and you take blocks that match that and encrypt it one block at a time, rather than, say, a letter at a time. Uh, and then XOR is a mathematical technique that it, you can think of it various ways, exclusive or. Um, if the bits are both one or both zero, the result is a zero, if I remember correctly. And then if one is a zero and the other is a one, then the result is a one. So it's sort of like doing addition and throwing away the carry in binary. But it's an interesting technique. Um, so you know, what a block cipher is doing is using a technique like exclusive or operating on a fixed length block of bits and then doing this some number of times, and that's the number of rounds. Uh, that can be a large number. Uh, for instance, uh, anyone here use LastPass? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, LastPass, by default, does uh, 5,000 rounds of this on your local machine, and then when you upload it to the server, they do 100,000 rounds more. So you can, you can do a lot of these. Um, so in cryptography, you know, we're looking at computerized stuff. So everything is binary. It's just a series of ones and zeros. And if you do XOR, uh, and XOR, by the way, is a, a reversible operation. So yeah, if they're, if they're both the same, the result is zero, and if they're different, the result is one. And as I said, yeah, it's coding and encrypting are two different things. So here's an example. Uh, I want to send a message, but the message I want to send is cat. Now, the coding scheme I'm using is ASCII. So I look up the ASCII codes for C, A, and T. Nothing hidden here at all. This is just a way of sending things 
using zeros and ones that the computer will understand, and your computer would receive it and turn it back into CAT. No big deal. Then I have a key, and I've decided to use as a key dog. Now, this key is the secret part, right? This is the thing that I'd have to agree. So, you know, I could go to Tom and say, I'm going to send you a message, the key is dog. So, how does XOR work? Uh, I write my message in binary, and then under it, I've got my key. And what's the result? Well, both ones, a zero. Both ones, a zero. Both zeros, a zero. And then, oh, okay, a zero and a one. That gives me a one. A one and a zero, that gives me a one. That's how exclusive or works. Not, not terribly difficult. So. And if you XOR the result, you would get back the same message. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to prove to yourself that that is the case. <laughs> So an encryption algorithm, algorithm is a procedure that can incorporate any number of steps. So an encryption algorithm has to be something that is combining a number of these operations. And in cryptography, XOR is almost always a major part of all of this. Now, symmetric encryption, it has to be completely reversible. Well, XOR is completely reversible. So if, if I encrypted using 5,000 rounds of XOR, I can decrypt using 5,000 rounds of XOR if I know the key. <clears throat> if I don't know the key, I've still got a problem. And uh, that's, that key is the part where you really need to start thinking, OK, it's like a password, really. Right? If your password is insecure, if your key is insecure, it doesn't matter how much of this other stuff you did. It's not going to get you anywhere. Now, the data encryption standard was one of the initial ones. Block size was set at 64 bits. Uh, and you will not be surprised to hear Although IBM was doing this for the government, the government, another part of the government, a three-letter agency, saying, oh, could you make it a little bit weaker? <laughs> uh, and so they kind of compromised. I mean, I think the NSA was looking for 48 bits. It's like, you know, yeah, we can, we can decrypt that easy. Uh, they came up with uh, basically, well, let's devote one bit for each byte as uh, parity checking. And so effectively what you had was 56 bits. That was DES. Now, how long was that good for? Not terribly long, but it was an important step. So Bruce Schneier, what I said is, is kind of my guru about all of this. The DES did more to galvanize the field of cryptanalysis than anything else. Now there was an algorithm to study. So that was an important step. So by 1999, you could brute force DES in about 22 hours. So not that secure. Well, let's just do more of it. Triple DES. So the same 56-bit keys, but now there's three of them. So you know, that added enough that right now it's kind of sort of still safe. So if you see three DES, you know, it's probably all right. But uh, NIST, that's the National Institute for Standards and Technology here in the United States. Uh, they said, uh, you know, we need to do a little bit better. So they went for advanced encryption standard. So you've probably seen ADS. Um, and that 
of the things commonly available now is probably the best. Um, there is a new standard that they just finished the competition a few months back um, for a new encryption standard, but uh, it's, it's not in widespread use uh, and probably won't be for a little while. Now then there's Rheindahl. Um, I'm told that's the pronunciation and it's based on the names of these people from the Netherlands and that's the basis of AES. So the block size here is 128 bits. Uh, the key size could be any, uh, any of these three and so if you see AES 256 what you're seeing is that the key size is 256 bits. Right? The block size is still 128. And again, you do all the repeated rounds. Okay. So all of these are symmetric. <coughs> so there's a lot of XOR, blocks, and all of that. Um, single shared key. Note that we have not had to talk about randomness. And entropy is the technical term for randomness. The more entropy, the more random. Uh, and you don't need it here, because the, the question is simply, do we agree on what the key is? Now, asymmetric gets around the key distribution problem. But to do that, you've got to have not just the one-way functions, you've got to have a pretty good amount of entropy or randomness. And I say these are the, the three approaches that have been used, RSA being the large prime number multiplication approach. Now factorization, this is when we talked about the arms race. Um, computationally infeasible with current technology, uh, assuming you do it properly. But this is one of those things. I, there was a famous um, example of a quote, Bill Gates, years ago. Someone had asked him, you know, what do you think are some of the key problems in computing that we're going to be able to deal with? And his answer was, we need to find ways to factor large prime numbers. Well, everyone laughed because a prime number doesn't have factors. <laughs> but what he was talking about was this problem. You know, research is, is going on all the time with this stuff. And you know, you probably want to keep up with it if you're at all interested in security. Right. So the numbers that we're looking at are generally uh, 1,024 digits, uh, not too close to each other, but they should both be good sized. Um, and then that product is used to generate other prime numbers which form the key pair. One is public, the other is private. Now the street logarithm is fi finding an integer that solves a logarithmic equation used in El Gamal and in Diffie Hellman Merkel key exchange. And the particular numbers, that's where the entropy comes in. And if you ever see a reference to perfect forward secrecy, and I don't really have time to get into it, but it's a fascinating topic, um, Diffie Hellman Merkel is key to perfect forward secrecy. If you're paranoid, you want to take a look at perfect forward secrecy. <laughs> Now, elliptic curve is a new one, and it's uh, an evolution of the discrete logarithm. Uh, you choose a curve with uh, certain properties, and then a point on that curve, and then find the discrete logarithm at that point. And then the entropy comes in in choosing where that point is going to be on the curve. Now, there have been some issues here. National Institute for Standards and Technology recommended 15 curves as suitable. 
unfortunately, NSA was involved in this process of selecting these curves. And they pushed one that even at the time, people were going, why on earth did they pick that one? It's the most butt-ugly one of the bunch. Uh,